If you have ever thought about using real estate as a means to reduce taxes, then look no further than this video. In today's video, I'm gonna teach you why creating losses with real estate could be the key to you offsetting your W-2 and your 1099 income. But more importantly about today's video, I'm gonna show you the exact step-by-step -step process that you need to take if you would like to purchase a rental property that is gonna turn around and create a loss on the tax return to offset your W-2 and your 1099 taxes. Welcome back to Taxes Made Simple, guys. I'm your host, Carlton Dennis. I'm a licensed enrolled agent, and as my job as a tax strategist is to teach you the tax code and to make sure you're utilizing it to the fullest extent. Now, in today's video, I'm gonna be talking about a very important topic to my heart, which is real estate. I believe that real estate will be the means on how I retire and how I pass on assets to my children who I don't have yet. But the reason why I wanna talk about real estate is because real estate has been the number one strategy that I've used as a tax consultant to help my customers save money on taxes. And the reason why real estate is one of the most desirable strategies for me to use in order to reduce taxpayers' money is because real estate allows for them to build wealth at the same time while reducing taxes. And there's not too many assets that you can park your money in that allow for you to do this. So in today's video, I wanna to explain to you the rules around how to create a real estate loss on your tax return. I'm gonna talk about how to utilize the real estate losses. I'm gonna make sure you understand the short-term rental rules as well as the real estate professional status. And most importantly, I'm gonna teach you how to maximize your tax savings for 2023 so you can save the most amount of money while being able to grow. If that is you and you're somebody that knows that real estate is a means on how you're gonna build wealth, then this will be the video that you're gonna to wanna to lock in on. This will be the video that you're gonna to wanna to share. I'm gonna give you 100% of what I have and I want you to understand Understand this so you can be able to help yourself and your family members find financial freedom. So without further ado, let's dive in. Now, the first thing that we have to talk about, guys, when it comes to real estate is we need to invite in the rules. You see, I'm not the person that made the rules, but I am going to be the one that's teaching you them today. And the rules that I want you to understand revolves around passive activity losses. So if you have a pen and a notepad out, I want you to write this down. The passive activity loss rules were created in 1987. But you may not remember what happened in 1987. I was not born yet. In 1987, the president was Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan decided to implement the Tax Reform Act. The Tax Reform Act lowered the marginal tax rates, but at the same time, it took away a lot of tax loopholes. God damn it! What? And one of the tax laws that was created was the Passive Activity Loss Rules. Now, you might be wondering, what exactly are passive activity losses? I'm gonna to explain to you. Anytime that you go into real estate, which is considered a passive business, what do I mean by passive? Technically, after you purchase one of these investment properties, you don't have to work additionally in order to get paid from the property. The principal pay down is happening from the tenant who is living inside of your property based on the agreement that you have established as a landlord. This agreement that you establish as a landlord of your rental property allows for you to earn passive income from your tenants if they're paying you. What the passive activity loss rules did was it limited the amount of passive losses that are generated from real estate to be able to flow over to offset W-2 income if you're working a W-2 job, 1099 income if you're self-employed, or even stock or crypto income. But what the passive activity loss rules were created for was it was created to stop everyday W-2 taxpayers from investing in real estate as a means to just avoid taxes. I don't think that's right. It ain't supposed to be like that. You see, the government runs consensus all the time. And what I mean by a consensus is that they're studying various different tax returns. During the year of 1986, the IRS studied tax returns of high net W-2 taxpayers. At the time, if you made over $250,000 as a W-2 taxpayer, taxpayer, you were considered high net. But a majority of these W-2 taxpayers that were making over $250,000 were doctors, lawyers, and physicians. A lot of these doctors, lawyers, and physicians are working longer than 40 hours a week. Some of them are putting in 50, 60, sometimes 80 hour work weeks. But you know what they were doing? They were purchasing real estate, which was a smart decision at the time. They were using the losses from real estate to offset their W-2 and their 1099 income. So even though that they were making more money year over year, just as you might be as a W-2 or 1099 taxpayer, they weren't seeing their taxes increase at the same time. And this bothered the government. Hence why we have the passive 
activity loss rules. What the passive activity loss rule prevents us from doing as W-2 or 1099 taxpayers is it prevents us from being able to just buy a real estate, letting this property create deductions, a loss, and then being able to use the loss to offset our W-2 and 1099 income. It prevented this from happening. Instead, what the passive activity loss rules did was it determined what is considered a passive investment versus a non-passive investment. And if you have a passive investment moving forward from 1987 till today, because we're still in 2023, you are not allowed to use passive losses to offset your active forms of income, which is your W-2, your 1099, and even stock and crypto is considered active forms of income. Now, this angered tons of W-2 taxpayers. And when I say multiple people felt the impact, we saw a lot of taxpayers see their taxes increase from 1987 all the way up until 1994. In 1994, the IRS came back and they adjusted some of the laws around passive activity loss rules. And what they really defined was they'd said, there's about 11 different people who get to fit into this bucket of being able to use passive losses and convert them over to non-passive losses to offset their W-2 or their 1099 income. These 11 real property trader businesses include real estate property development, real estate redevelopment, real estate construction, real estate reconstruction, real estate acquisitions, real estate conversion, rental real estate, which is choosing to rent out the property, rental operations, rental management, leasing, or brokering. If you are in one of these 11 real property trader businesses, as the IRS defines them, then you're in a position to be able to use the time that you spend in those real property trader businesses to allow for you to convert your real estate losses to become active losses. Now, if you're following me, you're starting to understand the history around the rules of the passive activity losses. But one of the things that we have not covered yet is what is a passive activity loss versus a non-passive loss. You see, when you decide to go into real estate, you will be able to receive depreciation. I talk about depreciation quite often on this channel. Essentially what depreciation is, is the ability to recover the cost of the wear and tear of your rental property over the course of time. The IRS believes that your property will wear and tear down over the course of 27 and a half years. And so they allow for you to recover the cost of your building over the course of 27 and a half years in equal increments. But one of the items that we like to do as tax professionals is we like to adjust the amount of depreciation that you're able to claim. Anytime that you make adjustments to depreciation, you can force a paper loss on the tax return. And I wanna to explain to you how paper losses are created. When you decide to go into rental real estate, you will collect rental income. This is taxable income to you. But nine times out of 10, and when I say nine times out of 10, 90% of most real estate investors will never pay taxes on the rental income that they're receiving due to the other expenses associated with the property. The other expenses that are associated with owning a rental property include the maintenance, the management fees, the interest on your loan, and could also include repairs. But most importantly, and the biggest of those expenses that you receive year over year, it's called depreciation. And that wear and tear over the course of 27 and a half years ends up giving you a great write-off every single year that is offsetting that income that you are receiving from your tenants. These expenses that you incur on a yearly basis plus depreciation can put your business of real estate investing at a loss. And this loss is what is desired by the rich. You see, the rich never wanna pay taxes on their rental income, and more importantly, the rich wanna use their rental losses to offset their W-2, which is their earned income, and their 1099 income from running their LLCs and their S corporations. But in order for them to be able to get this loss, they need to have enough depreciation. And this is why the game of real estate is considered a game. 
You see, most people think that investing in real estate is about trying to just replace your nine to five salary with your amount of cash flow that is coming off of the property. But if you're just thinking about only the cash flow and you're not factoring in the depreciation and the loss that the depreciation can do for you, then you may not be as enthusiastic to go into real estate because you may not think that the juice is worth the squeeze. When you go into real estate, one of the things that you have to take into consideration is you're, you're taking on a loan and you're taking on an interest rate. Right now, interest rates are hovering around seven and a half percent. So getting access to debt is not cheap right now. That's just expensive in itself. When you decide to go into real estate, your property may not cash flow more than a hundred or two hundred dollars a month. To you and your eyes, it may not seem worth it to go into real estate and to deal with the headaches of real estate for only a hundred or two hundred dollars a month. Around here, that's not enough. But here is where the interesting game starts to take fold. The savvy real estate investors, the wealthy ones, those who are of status, those who have made wealth in this space, understand that their cash flow does not come from their tenant just being able to pay down their mortgage. Their cash flow comes in the form of tax savings. If I told you that instead of receiving $200 a month, you're actually receiving $2,000 a month when you factor in depreciation, that's a completely separate conversation. And when we think about it, you probably want to know, well, how can depreciation really give me an extra $1,800 a month in cash flow? It's because of the taxes you're saving on your earned income. Now, if you're saving taxes on your earned income, you have to understand how to create a loss and how to be able to utilize those losses. Now, when you decide to create a loss on your tax returns from real estate, this can be done in one of two ways. A loss can be created as a passive loss, which can only offset passive forms of income, such as other capital gain income or any type of other passive income, such as dividend income that you could be receiving off the interest of your bank accounts. But many people want to use real estate losses to offset their non-passive income. When you go down the road of trying to understand how to use real estate losses to offset your active forms of income, you'll run into the real estate professional status. This term, real estate professional status, gets thrown around a lot on the internet and has caused a lot of confusion for many W-2 taxpayers. Many W-2 taxpayers are working a full-time job and they understand that real estate professional status is a term where you have to qualify for something in the real estate space to be able to use real estate losses to offset your W-2 or 1099 income. But here are the rules around real estate professional status. If you are trying to qualify to use real estate losses to offset W-2 income. You don't have to get a real estate professional's license. You don't have to go back to school, but you do have to spend time managing your own real estate investments. The government has deemed that to be 750 hours a year in real estate management. So if you have an asset that's close by to your house or if you have an asset that's out of state, it still doesn't matter. The time period is 750 hours. But here's the other part of that rule. The other part of the rule around real estate professional status states that you have to spend half of your working time in real estate as opposed to any other job or profession. And this is what disqualifies 99% of all W-2 taxpayers. You see, W-2 taxpayers are spending a good amount of their time on Zoom calls, phone meetings, working out in the field, getting things done for their employer. But if you are showing that you're spending more time in your real estate operation than with your employer, that means that you might not be able to grow your W-2 salary and be able to get to that place where you can eventually turn around and invest more money in real estate. And that is the problem with the passive activity loss rules. This is why Ronald Reagan implemented it. Ronald Reagan knows that if you spend more time putting money into real estate and allowing that real estate to offset your W-2 income, eventually you're gonna retire as a W-2 taxpayer and eventually you're gonna be paying less into tax dollars. This is all a part of the government system, which is why they put these passive activity loss rules in place. But if you're able to manage your properties to a certain capacity as a short-term rental, we have a way in which we can get around the passive activity loss rules. Enlighten me. 
When you decide to go into real estate, you can choose to invest into a long-term rental or a short-term rental. Depending on your involvement in real estate will determine whether or not you're able to unlock your real estate losses. If you're on the W-2 side of the table or if you're working in a business full-time, I'm gonna tell you right now, qualifying as a real estate professional will be extremely hard unless you have a spouse that is currently not working. One of the ways in which we can get around this is by purchasing a short-term rental business. You see, when you decide to go into short-term rentals, this is considered an active business depending on what you're doing. Based on those same laws that were implemented in 1987 as a part of the Tax Reform Act, inside of Code Section 469, it states that if you're running a short-term rental business with customers who are staying in your property on average seven days or less, per customer, and if you're materially participating in your short-term rental business, then you can qualify to use the real estate losses to offset your W-2 and 1099 income, as this will be considered now an active business. But let's go over the rules around running a short-term rental business, because it's not as easy as just buying a property and listing it on Airbnb. When you decide to go down the route of qualifying to use a short-term rental to offset your W-2 and 1099 taxes, you're going to need to make sure that you're managing the property for a certain amount of time. In order to understand how much time you need to manage on the short-term side versus purchasing a long-term rental and qualifying as a real estate professional, comes down to understanding what's called material participation. Now, if you're following me, you've learned quite a bit of terminology thus far. We've gone over real estate professional status which is a two-part test stating that you have to spend 750 hours and half of your time in your real property trader business. We talked about the 11 real property trader businesses that were defined in 1994 when the IRS decided to update the passive activity loss rules definition. We also talked about the Tax Reform Act and why Ronald Reagan implemented the Tax Reform Act and how he decided to close loopholes for the average W-2 taxpayer. And most importantly, we talked about depreciation and how it's taken over the course of 27 and a half years for residential real estate, and it can be accelerated via the cost segregation study performed on the tax returns. Now, in order to understand this next step, when it comes to short-term rentals, you need to understand the new terminology around material participation. Material participation is what it sounds like. You're materially there participating in whatever the activity is that you're trying to qualify for. The thing about material participation is that the IRS created seven different tests for material participation. But here's one of the best parts about material participation you only have to pass one test in order to say that you have materially participated in your short-term rental. Boom shakalaka, hell yeah. Of those tests, the easiest test, and the one I'm gonna give to you today, is spending 100 hours in your real property trader business and more than any other person. And I wanna define that. What does 100 hours mean? And what does more than any other person mean? When you decide to spend time in your real estate operation, 100 hours means that you are spending personal service time, whether that's managing the property, negotiating the loan, getting the property furnished, traveling to the property to check on the Airbnb, switching doorknobs, anything related to that Airbnb property, even communicating with the guests who are staying in the property or coordinating your cleaning crew to come and clean that property all counts towards material participation. The IRS states that you only need 100 hours of material participation. And I'll be honest with you, since I own short-term rentals myself in Florida, I can tell you a majority of that 100 hours is really spent in just acquiring the short-term rental. After you've acquired the short-term rental, you will spend the rest of your time garnering the hours by managing your tenants who are coming into the property. One of the beautiful things about running a short-term rental business is that you get to benefit from the cost segregation study. The cost segregation study is our tool as tax professionals to accelerate the depreciation on your investment property. By accelerating depreciation on the investment property, we can now force the paper loss. And when we force a paper loss, on average, you are typically receiving 20 to 30% of your building's value accelerated to a one-year write-off. 
To give you an example of how big this can be, let's say that you purchased a $200,000 property and the building, the mount that you actually get to write off, which is called the building structure, was $100,000. That means that you would be able to take as a tax write-off up to twenty dollars to $30,000 in one year offsetting W-2 or 1099 income. Not to mention, if you're managing the property yourself, you can choose to claim additional management expenses if you take it as far as setting up a management company. Now that is for a completely other video, but that is another way for you to create more deductions on the tax return to create an even bigger paper loss. Now that you understand a little bit more about the cost segregation study and how a paper loss can be created and the rules around material participation, short-term rentals, and even real estate professional status, the next question is, is how do you use a real estate loss correctly? You see, when it comes to using a real estate loss, we typically only do cost segregation studies. We only accelerate depreciation when we know that we can offset active forms of income. The reason why we do this is because we never want to get into a position where we're locking up losses as passive losses. You see, once losses are locked as passive losses, there is no way to just unlock them one day when you decide to switch your property over to a short-term rental or unlock them one day when you decide to spend 750 hours and more time in real estate than your W-2 job. So the best thing that you can do for yourself is invest in real estate early and often and put yourself in a position to be able to unlock your losses to eventually offset your W-2 and 1099 income. All right, guys, now that we covered the real estate professional status, the short-term rental rules and material participation, let's go over around how to find a great real estate deal. When it comes down to finding a great real estate deal as it pertains to taxes, you wanna make sure that you're looking at two items the building's value and the land value. Now you might be wondering, where do I find this information? If you use websites like Trulia, Redfin, Zillow, and you scroll all the way down to the bottom of these pages, you'll notice at the bottom that they show you the property tax history report. Amongst the property tax history report, you'll see two different line items. You'll see land plus addition. The land value is the amount of money that has been allocated to the land structure of the entire property. And the addition is what you and I know as the actual building's structure. Here's the thing. When it comes to being able to take depreciation and creating a loss, the government only allows for us to use the building's value. This is so important to understand. As you decide to shop for real estate as a means to offset your W-2 or 1099 income, it will be important for you to study real estate online way ahead of time. The reason why you would wanna study real estate ahead of time is because you need to be able to identify properties way in advance that meet the qualifications to perform a cost segregation study. In our office, we have a rule of thumb. If we're gonna do a cost seg, we wanna make sure that it's on a property that has at least 65 or 70% building value allocation or more. A majority of the properties here in California do not have building allocations at 60 or 70%. And the reason this is the case is because land in California is worth more than the buildings here in California. And the architects and the engineers are fully aware of this. But when you go out of state to places like Texas, Missouri, or even Oklahoma, or even Florida, you'll come to find that the building value outweighs the land value. On a recent property I just purchased in Texas, the building's value was 92% and the land value was 8%. Of that 92% building value, I'm able to accelerate close to 20 to 30% of that amount on my tax returns this year to offset W-2 and 1099 income. This is so important for me as a tax provider to be able to educate you on this subject. Because if you decide to go into real estate, it's not just about cash flow. It's not just about getting that principal pay down. It's also about the tax benefits, which comes in the form of depreciation. But you wanna make sure that you're buying a property that is giving you the depreciation that you're looking for. This has been part one of the video around how to use real estate losses to offset W-2 and 1099 income. As we head over into part two, we'll discuss depreciation recapture, how to avoid depreciation recapture taxes, and how to set yourself up for long-term investing. I wanna say thank you so much for watching this video. If you're somebody that's a fan of my channel and you love what we do here, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and go ahead and like this video and feel free to drop a comment so I can comment back. 
If you're interested in learning more strategies like this, then I would encourage you to join our tax-free wealth event. So if you're interested in learning strategies from me as it pertains to real estate, depreciation, and being able to set your family up for success, I look forward to seeing you at the Tax-Free Wealth live event. That's it for today's video. I'll see you guys on the next one. Cheers.